Welcome to the third episode of the European Dialogue for Sustainable Cities. My name is Sara Vaurama. I'm the other host together with Jussi Knuttila. In this dialogue series, we want to highlight solutions that other cities could use in their daily development. Every episode also features one of the previous European Green Capital winners. Today's theme is biodiversity. And our guest city today is Nijmegen from Holland, which uh, was the European Green Capital in 2018. And hello everyone, my name is Jussi Knuttila and I'm your second host of the evening. Hey, you can participate in the discussion by asking a question in the chat on YouTube. So let's start the discussion. And this time around we actually have a new message wall where we can see your comments in our studio here in the discussion. So please ask questions from our panelists, participate in the discussion and uh, yes, see you. It's great here to hear where you are joining from. Today we are happy to host five excellent panelists in the discussion. First I would like to introduce you to Ton uh, from the city of Nijmegen. Uh, Ton is the uh, senior policy advisor in the fields of green and climate adaptation for the last 15 years in the municipality of Nijmegen. Ton was also an uh, important member of the project team in the European Green Capital Year, and that was also the time when we met first time. He has a lot of international networks, uh, responsibilities being the European contact in the Green Capital Network, also the networker if ICLE and the Covenant of Mayors for Climate and Energy. So a lot of actions going on still in IMEG and it's great to have you here. Jo he's will joining us from the IMEG and welcome Ton. And our second guest today is Helga Silfors. Helga Silfors is the environmental manager in the city of Heinola. Helga has previously worked as a journalist and also an environmental expert in the forest industry. And uh, outside work, Helga leads a group of scouts. Just two weeks ago, Helga and the group of scouts, they went on an excursion to ski to look for signs of flying squirrels and also admire the wintry Bocklands in Heinola. So, joining us from Heinola, welcome to the discussion, Helga. And our third guest today is Ian MacGregor Force from the University of Helsinki. Ian is a professor at the Ecosystems and Environment Research Program in Helsinki University. Ian has devoted most of his research in the past 15 years to untangling the response of wildlife communities to anthropogenic ecological disturbances as well as the ecology of invasive bird species as bird diversity drivers. And Ian is currently part of the advisory board of the International Network Urban Biodiversity and Design, seeking to promote the implementation of the United Nations Convention on Biological Diversity, CBD, in urban areas. So, joining us from Helsinki, welcome to the discussion, Ian. Great. Our fourth guest today is Ville Niinistä. Ville is a member of the European Parliament and the Greens and EFA Group Coordinator in the Committee of Industry, Research and Energy and a member of the Committee on Environment too. Ville served as a Finland's Minister of Environment from 2011 till 2014 and he was also a former member of Finnish Parliament, former party leader of Green Party of Finland, but a current member of the City Council of Turku. Welcome to the discussion, Ville. And our final guest today is Jussi Mikkula. Jussi works at WWF Finland as conservation advisor, covering multiple aspects of political, business and behavior change in the context of natural resource use and halving the footprint. Jussi has extensive experience in sustainability transitions and system change. And uh, Jussi is joining us from Helsinki, I presume. Welcome to the discussion. 
And Sara, I can already see that we have uh, some answers from uh, from our viewers in the chat. So we have people from Finland, people from Lahti, and uh, some greetings from Essen. So okay. it's great to have uh, to know that the chat works. Definitely. And while we are discussing, you have always the possibility to ask questions from the panelists, also comment some of the topics, and we'll try to pick your questions also to the discussion. Um, okay, so we have a great group of panelists, and I expect a lot from this discussion. Uh, it was said um, that 2020 was supposed to be the super year for biodiversity and environment. Researchers had been preparing a series of important meetings to try to make leaders and policymakers to act on tackling the biodiversity crisis. But then, as we know, the COVID-19 outbreak hit us all. This is a question now to, to all of the panelists. And if uh, you want to answer this, you can just raise your hand, either physically or using the, the Teams hand tab. So what was left, what do you think, what was left from the super year of biodiversity 2020 besides the global pandemic? And we would also love to hear from our listeners and viewers, what was left from the super year of biodiversity 2020 besides the global pandemic? So please answer in the chat. Great. Do we have any raised hands? Ian. Okay, so yes. hi to everyone. Um, first of all, thank you for the invitation to this panel. Um, so I think that uh, we don't need a year for biodiversity. We need uh, following decades for biodiversity to come in linking science and government. So um, I think that actually the pandemic has made us learn several things about biodiversity in cities, for example. At the beginning of the pandemic, we saw lots of, of feedback in the, in the social media of biodiversity returning to cities. And there has been lots of controversy about this, but I think that biodiversity itself has shown us how our way of living in cities and in non-urban areas is very impactful and how can we really change this type of, of dynamics in which we could actually make a really, really uh, fast difference. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Ian. I much agree that we, we have to focus on big uh, plans, not only for one year, but Ville, what do you think about this? Yes, well, obviously, I think it is, it's, there's been a big breakthrough if you think about uh, biodiversity's role in global discussion about environmental challenges, especially in the political level and economic level. So companies and businesses are also involved. As a kind of like environment, environmentalist uh, politician who has worked with these issues for 15, 20 years, I think this is a big shift. Even though last year the UN uh, COP15 for biodiversity convention, the meeting was postponed for next uh, autumn in, in China. The goals are still same, that we are now looking for a global deal that would have binding protection targets, both marine and terrestrial. There is a discussion about protecting 30% of global aerial to achieve biodiversity targets by 2030. And obviously also understanding of how sustainable cities, our whole economic activity, how we change our surroundings, have to take into consideration and live by the conditions of biodiversity everywhere. So I think this is a big shift. And pandemic itself is also one uh, result of our how we lost, you know, balance with nature in the sense that pandemics are in increased in conditions where wildlife has less room and also hygienic conditions for wildlife others. So it's a result of biodiversity crisis too. Yeah. Great. Uh, Jussi, what would your argument on this? Yes, thank you and hello everyone. <clears throat> Ville covered and, and I already covered many, many good points there. <clears throat> I, I just mentioned that it's kind of ironic that the pandemics that is probably due to the kind of a coll collision of, of humanity and, and, and the, and the um, Kind of the places where where wildlife wildlife can can flourish in without without kind of uh, 
colliding with each other and and, and the the viruses um, or other other sources of, of pandemics kind of spreading through the excessive use of natural resources. So it's kind of ironic that this kind of event uh, stopped the superior of biodiversity, but maybe maybe it also prepared us for for even deeper uh, understanding and 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 ready for the for the quite substantial changes that we need in our societies uh, in order to avoid further further crises. And this is like the the. Uh, <clears throat> Um, the dystopian picture is the is the enforcing, uh, reinforcing bad climate conditions and 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 uh, degradation of of human, uh, I mean natural systems, but by but I, I hope we are moving towards the utopian future where where we really take the action now and not later. Mm -hmm. So actually what you might be saying is that uh, the COP15 might get more results out of it because of the situation that we are currently having. But let's go a little bit deeper into that topic later on. But I, I suggest that we'll take one of the questions also from the chat. Right. All right. Yes. Uh, yeah, the chat is... Uh, it's really flying. Yeah. What do we have there? Um, short one. Short one to all of you. Um, a question to panelists, how did you become interested in biodiversity? Only like a couple of words if you are able to explain it. Let's start with Helga. I think it has been in my hobbies when scouting and uh, making uh, uh, or watching the nature learning to know other species or more more species uh, step by step <laughs> I would say Great. Thank you, Helga. thanks Ton um, I was always interested in uh, in nature because we walked with our family or always during the holidays and uh, that led to the fact that I uh, did study biology at the university in Nijmegen. And since then, uh, yeah, my interest has grown and grown and grown. And now I'm working for the municipality as a policy advisor on uh, biodiversity as well. Great. Because and let's go deeper into the Nijmegen case soon. But first, Ian's history about biodiversity. Well, I, I, I was into biodiversity since I was very young back in Mexico. Not falling in love with biodiversity over there is very difficult. But uh, the issue is that biodiversity always has surprises. So I think that's one of the things that has kept me uh, following birds and stuff uh, across my life. So my, my love started in the Turku archipelago with my family when I was a small small kid. We did boat trips into small islands and looking at the, the wildlife and the bird, watching birds and, and the birds of the, the archipelago. So I think, you know, the marvels of an archipelago like Turku is, is such that as a small kid, you know, that fills your fantasy. And I've been on that road ever since also when it, when it, what, when it comes to purification of waters and, and the Baltic Sea and the eutrophication, that is something that is, you know, I've seen it for 40 years, so that is close to my heart as well. It's an amazing place in the world. Uh, you'll see. Yes, thank you. Um, I think the other panelists kind of covered how I feel that most of the people somehow instinctive, instinctively know the uh, our own self-dependence on, on nature. Maybe not cognitively, but instinctively. And I, I think that that's, um, we, most of the people just feel it and know it, even though they wouldn't have the, like the professional expertise on that. Great. That's also, it's, it's born with us in a way, I would yeah. say. We just opened the eyes. Great answer. Yeah. And going to Nijmegen. Ton, Nijmegen is Holland's first European green capital and the year 2018 
was your year in the spotlight. And nature themes, biodiversity were very much advocated in the program. So uh, could you share us what are the best practices that uh, you have in place in the city when it comes to nature protection? Yeah, Nijmegen is a special city. It's not only the oldest city of Holland, but it's also a very compact uh, city. I always say it is a green city, but the green areas, nature areas are from our neighboring municipalities. So we have no rural area, but we do have a river crossing uh, the city. And since we are building at the other side of the river, we have now a river in the middle of our city, as you can see in the picture behind me. And we created there a very huge climate adaptation project with the second river. And that's also our river park in the center of our city. So the nature 2000 areas on both sides of the city, but also in the middle of our city. And the other thing is, and then I come also to the strange year we have behind. Um, biodiversity in cities is even in Holland uh, bigger than in the rural area. And uh, especially what we saw the last year was that a lot of citizens uh, had only one thing to go outside the houses and they went for a walk in the, in the forest or in the nature area. Even it was too busy there. So we had to close sometimes the parking lots near the uh, nature areas, also in, in Nijmegen. And that made the focus very clear in the city on uh, biodiversity in the city. And I'm glad that I have a new colleague, which is a city ecologist, as we call it. And she's uh, very um, specialized in the communication with the citizens, having citizen science the coming years on uh, yeah, enforcing uh, biodiversity in the city. Thank you, Tan. And you were discussing the COVID-19. Uh, has it uh, somehow also affected the discussion about the nature protection or um, um, has, has this been still a topic or? Uh... Yeah, what has changed in, in the year 2018 when we were green capital and uh, now is that even more we work in an integral way in our city. We have a very flat organization, you can say, and even, uh, yeah, all the, the colleagues are thinking in an integral way, in a sustainable uh, way. Um, and what we have done uh, the last year is making a new uh, central um, structure plan, eh? our uh, development, uh, spatial development plan, and is now based on a green blue structure. And biodiversity is also uh, besides climate adaptation, a big topic, and that has never been before. So due to the last year, maybe that is uh, yeah, going stronger and stronger, I can say. Okay. Thank you, Tan. I think we definitely can share these experiences in, in all the cities. Yes. Basically, a lot of the nature reservoir areas were completely occupied uh, in Helsinki area, almost in a problematic way, but it's great that people found these places. Um, mm -hmm. It has been a pleasure also to visit Nijmegen twice when we, you were the green capital and I really appreciate the work with the, with the waterways. You have been doing a great job and, and, and big investments to, to sustainable solutions there. It's a great work. Helga, you work as, work as the environmental manager in the city of Heinolan. Heinola is a rather small city, about 20,000 inhabitants. Uh, you are quite close to Lahti as well, and we work uh, together for the European Green Capital Year. But uh, what kind of relationship Heinola has with nature? Could you tell us a little bit more about the city, please? Yes. Heinola is a small town, not a city. <laughs> and it's, uh, I would say, um, I'll show you some pictures. I would say others may have parks in towns, 
but Heinola actually is a town in the park and it's uh, valued as a uh, one of the Finnish national urban parks and we have really rich nature it's because our landscape it's variable it's like a mosaic of little fields woodlands lakes and the ridge that uh, goes uh, through the city or through the town and that's why we have nature values everywhere and sometimes it's quite challenging for city planning and uh, building or constructions and we have learned to use our imagination how to fit together human life and nature values that's a really big promise too um, i've heard about the biodiversity solution really really pragmatic ones too and um, what kind of good solutions to support biodiversity you would like to share from Heinola with other European cities or towns? Uh, I'm not sure if it's an example of good practices, but right now we are running a kind of pilot project. Mm, a few years ago we found, found a need for a new building. It's a combined school and daycare building and it was planned for a good location but unfortunately uh, they found that the site was a territory for flying squirrel however me, we made an application and got permission to build the school anyway and um, the aim is both to build and let the squirrels continue living at the site. And it was made so that all the valuable trees were saved or planned to save, to be saved. And there was also a spring, a little, little natural spring on the site, and that was saved too. But during the, the constructions, uh, sometimes I was uh, desperate <laughs> and uh, almost sure that the flying squirrels won't survive. I think um, there was many challenges, but I have been monitoring the, the site during the constructions and no, and um, after it, the building is now completed in February and the school has uh, been there working uh, for four for weeks now. And the uh, flying squirrels are still living there. <laughs> so we can say they managed, they survived from the constructions and now we have to continue monitoring that we see how they react to the school children living on the same same site. But the flying squirrel is a nocturnal animal, so I think it, it will go well. There is some, uh, uh, for example, the lights at the schoolyard are kind of smart technology so that they get brighter only when someone passes the yard. Otherwise, they are quite uh, like a lighter light, <laughs> I'll say that. And uh, well, that's an interesting pilot. Really? And we are still, uh, still monitoring. Good. And it, it would be valuable for others also if you could share the solutions of that. Yes. And, and we know that the flying squirrels, they come even more common also in urban environments. So it's they are quite commonly nowadays found there as well. So it's important also for others to learn from this. Yes. And uh, Ian, you have recently moved to Finland and you have started your professorship at the Ecosystems and Environment Research Program in the University of Helsinki. So could you tell us a little bit about your background? Uh, what was most surprising for you in Finland when it's... Um, 
when we think about nature and cities? Uh, well, uh, first of all, about the, the background, I have been trying to understand urban biodiversity, as you said at the beginning, for over 15 years now. And uh, I have almost always studied um, Latin American cities. Uh, I have do, done some stuff uh, outside Latin America, but when I got here to, to Finland and um, got to know really closely uh, at least uh, Helsinki and Lahti because COVID has not allowed me to move a lot. Um, I've seen that the way in which Finnish people urbanize is way different. And there are many, many areas of, of opportunity to have more and more ecologically friendly cities. Uh, the other thing that surprised me a lot was the value of Finnish people towards nature. It is amazing the amount of people I see that they take their kids to school, but when they come back, they have their, their binoculars hanging and they're bird watching just in a short, you know, coming from school. So there is a very, very uh, high appreciation for, for biodiversity across the population that has, has been eye opening for, for me. Yeah, the closeness to nature, it's, it's uh, something that is a very, very uh, Finnish uh, characteristic to people. Uh, when you think about, you were discussing um, uh, ecologically friendly cities, but also the nature being close by. Um, if thinking about ecosystem services, urban biodiversity and cities, what would be the most interesting research topic that you could imagine? If you would start a completely new research, what would it be? Wow, it would, about, it would depend on the amount of the grant. But um, uh, I, think, I think that there are some topics in, in that arena that uh, will be the, the leads in the area. And I think that two of the major ones, one is um, the ecosystem services as pollination, for example, these kinds of very important uh, urban and urban fringe, suburban kind of, you know, uh, near the city. This is, is will, will be very important, but there's also the human health issue is is gaining lots of strength because when, when when we try to increase biodiversity in urban areas and we try to increase human health in urban areas we have to weave very very finely to have a, a positive positive responses towards these ecologically friendly cities so i i think i think that would be uh, a, a couple of, of interesting funded projects those, those topics sound really interesting to me. Great, and I, I must actually continue with that and picking some of the questions now from the YouTube chat because uh, people are also there talking about uh, research and also um, interactions between human health and biodiversity. So at least two different persons are asking about this and greetings from a global youth biodiversity network, for instance. Um, what kind of interactions uh, human uh, illnesses and viruses has with a, with a bigger global biodiversity? Do they have an interaction or not? Have you instant uh, comments on that? Okay, so, so uh, I have been working actually with some colleagues that are parasitologists and we actually just published a, a paper called Cities and Pandemics. Um, so, so I think there's a very important um, relationship between cities and pandemics because this is where most people gather in cities, and uh, it's the it's like if if we imagine the city as an organism, it's the huge vector, right? So, um, how we manage cities regarding um, pandemics and viruses is very important. It obviously depends on the type of virus, right? and on the spread uh, rates and everything. This, this virus, uh, many studies showed that, uh, for example, controlling um, air transport at the beginning of the, of the pandemic would have changed the scenarios completely. 
So, so, uh, and, and, and what's die? That's why, because, because uh, most major uh, airports are in major urban areas where you can very easily spread um, diseases. So I think that um, there is there is a growing information and evidence about how cities and pandemics need to be assessed in the future. So we don't have this kind of uh, of 2020 years. And we can also uh, continue the, the discussion of, of larger uh, human health questions and their interactions with biodiversity a little bit later. I'm sure that other panelists would have also comments on that, but let's get back to that issue a bit later. Uh, Ville, you have been acting as a shadow reporter of EU biodiversity strategy, which is hugely important for all of us. Tell us a little bit more about it. What is the strategy and what are the main targets of it? How it will affect our lives and the nature in Europe? Well, basically, what we have done in so far in the past is that we've had biodiversity protection targets uh, previously as well, and even globally agreed targets. We had so-called IG targets, uh, but none of them have been reached. And I think the problem has been that biodiversity has been very separate from rest of the decision making. So biodiversity has been only an issue for the environment ministers. Maybe something that is only looked through in the context of by protected areas. Obviously, we will need a lot more protected areas. That is very, very much true because biodiversity uh, loss is, uh, is, is at such a drastic scale that we need to increase the amount of protected areas. But I would still argue that the, even the bigger change is that we have to change the way we um, relate ourselves to biodiversity also there where we, we can't solely protect. So, so how economic activities around cities how resource chains are, are, are used, uh, how land is used. We are going to agriculture, we are talking about forestry. And I would also argue that when we in Finland easily like to say that, you know, we have a very close relationship with nature. Many Finns do. We have childhoods in summer cottages and we spend a lot of time in national parks and things. Finns do have an affin affiliation of, you know, we walk into forests a lot. But I would still argue that about 70-80% of the forest in southern Finland nowadays are plantations. They are tree plantations with, with only one, uh, uh, one uh, uh, type of tree of a similar age uh, building the structure of the forest. And that is not a biodiversity, you know, positive forest. It's a very narrow definition of forest. So, what we should do with the biodiversity strategy for 2030, we should look at also how we can protect biodiversity in our economic activities. And like Helga said, also when we build an uh, infrastructure, cities, and there are a lot of uh, low hanging fruits there as well. So, so uh, we have uh, uh, the goal, as I said, also in the EU bio biodiversity strategy to increase protected areas to 30%, both marine and terrestrial. But then there is a new innovation, which is very important. We also want to have a new EU law for restoration. So we want to rewild, restore nature also in areas that they are already degraded. And this can be uh, often close to cities areas where we have had like um, bird uh, nesting areas that have been degraded, uh, bog lands that can be easily, easily re uh, restored and, and renovated. And, and these kind of Concrete goals for also restoration is one way of also increasing biodiversity close to cities. And in Finland, we have the new biodiversity uh, protection program, Helmi program, that all very funds pro uh, things like uh, traditional landscapes, uh, uh, biotypes in agriculture by, by funding ways of increasing meadows and these kind of things. That's one thing that we already funding and the restoration law will look at that at the EU level. And also when it comes to cities, when we are discussing here cities, I think a lot of things like, you know, uh, Helka is also uh, coming from one of the first cities in Finland that has been part of the national uh, city uh, uh, park network, Kansallinen uh, Kaupunkipuisto as we call it. Uh, and and, uh, and uh, these, these national parks in cities are a way of also increasing biodiversity in cities. And, and we have a lot of... Uh, 
grasslands around and in cities that are cut, you know, unnecessarily. That we should also look at pollinators and 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 uh, how butterflies can can you know use these areas and how we can you know get back to times when when we were kids that there were so many butterflies around my school when I was a kid. But ten years later, they cut all of that grass away, and it's just you know modern grass with very little things living in it. Why can't we get the meadows back? So small things that can be achieved also in urban environments. The biodiversity strategy obviously is looking at the European level, but has a lot of concrete hints also how we can increase protection and also increase restoration of waterways is actually one big program there as well. But Don Heverhoven uh, definitely must have a lot of experience on uh, in, in the in the Dutch context. So looking at increasing biodiversity everywhere and not just holding the loss of biodiversity, I would say is the main goal of that strategy. Right. So it's a, it's a lot about working in different scales, right, and, and urban um, there are possibilities to protect, uh, for instance, forest in, in urban environment because we have less maybe also financial incentives to cut the trees. And so it's a possibility really to, to have more We actually do have some of the oldest forests in southern Finland are in the cities or very close to cities because they haven't been cut. So we need to also understand the value of them and not, not you know, let them be cut just because of, of you know, malpractice or whatever. So I would like to uh, maybe ask Ville uh, still from you about your personal um, thoughts about the, the becoming biodiversity COP. What are you expecting from that? What would be the big success of the, of the meeting? I think the biggest thing is that we should have also globally binding agreements. The, the, the targets we set and the monitoring and the methods and indicators to, for achieving those targets should be binding for all members or countries. So a similar structure as the Paris Agreement is for climate. Previously, biodiversity has been based too much on voluntary measures. And being binding doesn't mean that we have globally the same rules for everybody. You have to do the, precisely the same thing. That's not the, the aim of that. But we can address the biggest issues like overfishing, for example. Marine protection is a, is a, is a big thing for the sustainability of this whole planet. And, and a lot of things need to be done also outside the national jurisdiction of, of, of countries. So there's also that area we have to tackle. And then, then having uh, binding targets for biodiversity uh, protection everywhere is important that all countries start to mainstream biodiversity in their economic decision making. That is basically what, what we want to achieve in the COP15. Thanks a lot. And I would also say from the Finnish perspective, I think understanding also the effects of climate change to biodiversity in sensitive areas. In Finland, we have the northern uh, unique kind of nature which is kind of like moving northwards all the time, but there will be, you know, some species will be driven to the sea because of the, the change of uh, the climatic change. So we should also try to look how we can preserve biodiversity in the sense the Arctic sensitive biodiversity and 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 hold this process of, of, of losing biodiversity due to climate change. Thanks a lot. Good answer. You may also comment on this uh, biodiversity COP there in the YouTube chat box and we'll maybe get back to that one as well. Um, Jussi, I know that you are very familiar with EU biodiversity targets and strategy, but what do you think about it? Um, are, are the goals ambitious enough? Do, are we doing enough? Yes, thank you. <clears throat> um, I, I think Ville explained the background pretty well there, and, and um, just to put it in the context uh, once more, is that it was already 2010 that the the decline of biodiversity was supposed to be uh, turned uh, the bent curve upwards again. So we missed that target 10 years ago. So then there was a new target for 2020 to to halt the decline of biodiversity. As, as Willa mentioned, we missed that target too. So now there's another 10 years ahead of us. <laughs> so we keep kind of postponing the target and we, we have kept missing the target. So 
that that is where we are and that's that's um something we should really understand uh luckily the times are different in a sense that it, the biodiversity issue is becoming hopefully mainstreamed in the society but still um like one of the big big um um shortcomings of the EU biodiversity strategy is that <clears throat> it's it's a missing the reference to the overconsumption of natural resources because that is basically if we think of the more direct uh, reasons for biodiversity decline which are land use change over over exploitation of, of natural resources climate change pollution invasive species many of them are the phenomenons of of the underlying or over consumption of natural resources so that is something that needs to be underlined and highlighted that and and put really in the central place of of, of thinking in in order to kind of uh, get rid of the 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 underlying causing reason for the for the declining uh, biodiversity so uh, <clears throat> that that is uh, and that is something that we kind of keep missing even though we have the years of experience and even though um it's been on the agenda and and uh, as was mentioned it's it has been on the agenda of environmental ministers but i hope that it will really um filter through all, all, all to the other other um, kind of um, yeah like the economic decision making also just like when when we think of these these time frames I just mentioned an example from climate change it was uh, nine years ago approximately when the there was this starting this discussion about carbon bubbles of investments so like companies are investing in fossil fuels that can never be burned. It was about nine years ago. Now um, e it's in the EU, it's, a, uh, it's in the process of making this taxonomy, like what, what kind of uh, investment targets are more like um, climate friendly or environmental friendly. I'm not saying that the, the taxonomy is, is perfect at the moment, how it's turning out, but at least it's filtering through. So I think we need this similar kind of a progress when it comes comes to overconsumption. So just like to conclude this thing is that like we need more protected areas and we need more restoration as as Ville mentioned. That's a good thing. We need better production, but those two things are not enough. We need to have our footprint pretty fast of, of our over over consumption. We need to target that also, and that is that is something that is where the shortcomings are quite often. Thanks. Mm -hmm. I fully agree with you, um, <clears throat> and we know that the cities are doing quite a lot um, for the sustainability of. We of course, we could do still much more, um, but also the COVID um, has shown uh, the willingness of cities to really also react. Asked, um, what would you say, uh, you see, what would be the, the most important policy approaches for the cities to tackle these um, sustainability um, problems globally? <clears throat> yes, there are many things, as was as was mentioned here before, like uh, on a local level, like improving the local biodiversity and taking care of that and also by taking care of the the ecosystems locally we build uh the the benefits for for the health for the people and the physical activity of, of people by providing nice places and and um then uh, also we we build resilience towards climate change impacts but cities are the places where life happens and and that's all those are the places where where the consumption happens also quite often so um i think as as i mentioned earlier 
in the biodiversity um, strategies and thinking, we, we are missing too much of, of this uh, overconsumption perspective. So I would like to see champions among cities that can provide the citizens lifestyles, ability to live within planetary boundaries. So you can have a housing, you can have your transportation, you can have your food in a way that is within planetary boundaries. I think cities are really, really well placed to do that. Which are the policies? Uh, it's a difficult question, but I think that should be the aim. I, I agree. That's also a big question that we try to work um, also together with WWF and University of Helsinki to build a program of human health impacts and also uh, biodiversity questions uh, monitored simul simultaneously. So that's one question that we start working now even more. But let's go um, now to the chat question shortly. And I think Jussi has been picked some questions there. So please. Yes. Hello again from the message wall. Yeah. Our chat is on fire, I must say. Very, very good uh, questions here. And um, we have had a good discussion here. There's also great discussion about the insect populations in cities. And um, there's one question. Biodiversity is threatened by drastically reduced population of insects. Should cities uh, shift from protection of endangered species to generally nature and thus all populations? If yes, how? So this is a question to our panelists. Yes, Ian. Well, actually, as, as I think we should have learned already, we need to preserve systems. We need to preserve uh, not, not species. We need to, to preserve the functioning of the systems. So in this sense, I consider that uh, sometimes flagship species, sometimes umbrella species, can be a very useful tool, but I think that uh, people are more and more understanding why we were using these concepts and that the functioning of the system, it was ma it, it's what matters. And uh, I think that uh, invertebrates, specifically many pollinators, ha we have learned a lot about their decreases in our planet. Thank you, Ian. And then uh, Villa. Yes, I think uh, one of the problems we've also in the European Parliament noticed is that, uh, and it's also still lacking in the Commission's proposal for the biodiversity strategy, and we are trying to increase the quality of that side, is that the protection networks and biodiversity protection is, is um, a, a bit, you know, protected areas are shot with a, with a shotgun here and there, and they are not connected. So we have a, we need to in increase the connectivity of protection, and cities play a big role here as well. Obviously, if biodiversity would have to always go around a big city area, there would be a lot of loss of biodiversity. So thinking about green roofs and, and different kind of ways of increasing nature within the city will uh, increase the, the systemic protection of many species. And I think this is this is also very much the key we need to achieve. And I think Helka was also correct in that sense that in, in Finland sometimes people, and I've been also actually back in the days 20 years ago, I was the municipal board uh, chair of, of the environment protection uh, a, a committee in, in Karina, my, my hometown when I was young. And it often was kind of like when city plans infrastructure building, the ones responsible for the planning sector, they were kind of like, you know, that this is where we want to build, we will build this regardless of what the stupid environment people say. And that is totally wrong approach. This is changing, but 20 years ago it was like this, that we had to plan uh, from the start, from the scratch, with the environment and biodiversity in mind. How the thing we want to build, I mean, in cities you need to build, so that is not something I question, but how the building itself can support the biodiversity ex that ex exists there and even increase it. So that is the approach we need to take. Thank you, Villa. And then uh, I think it was Ton. It's your turn. Yeah. Um... What Ville said is, is right, but it's also uh, one of the most difficult topics in, in a city. 
like Nijmegen, Midside City. Um, most of the money goes to economic um, uh, projects, uh, mobility projects and building, building, building. And it's very difficult to get money and budget for the other side of building, 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 the public space and the health and well-being of people in the public space. Uh, and one of the things that has to be changed, and that's far away from global uh, level of uh, COP uh, on biodiversity, is the level of legislation in the city. We have now... Uh, planned and we managed the last year to get some nature inclusive building rules in our building rules. It's not all obliged by European laws or by, by uh, Dutch laws. It's uh, we are doing it by ourselves and also some other cities in Holland are doing that by ourselves in order to get some green uh, obliged green green roofs or green walls, but also nature areas uh, or uh, uh, spaces for birds and, and bats in the new building sites. And that is very, very difficult to get by the yeah the organized way uh, we plan to build houses. So project developers said uh, the good ones are already turning over, but a lot of people are still not uh, convinced of that because green has a lot of benefits, but are not uh, capitalized. Uh, the, the money goes to, to the, the building or to the street or to the sewer that is capitalized, but green only costs in the, in the eyes of uh, building uh, developers. And that has to change. And if you change that, then you can also take in account that you get more green in a densely built city like Nijmegen. And then when you have more green areas, you get also more uh, biodiversity. Thank you, Tan. And then we have two raised hands, uh, very uh, quick answers from Jussi and Helga to the question. And now Jussi, you are on, on a mute. So if you could unmute. Yes, yes. yes. Sorry. Um, yeah. So uh, I tried to be quick. Two points. Um, this is, don't take me wrong, because this might sound weird, but um i really i'm re really uh, for the for the for this idea of of uh, enhancing enhancing the um biodiversity in cities but if you think of like this the, the flying squirrels were mentioned already the reason why they are endangered is is basically the intensive forestry in finland but they find habitats in within the cities and and when they find habitats there, then they need to be protected. And then it's difficult to develop the cities because the flying squirrels are there. So so cities uh, should take care of the biodiversity within the cities, but the biodiversity should be taken care of in, in the in the sparsely populated areas also in order to have the species in good conditions so that there would not be that many difficulties in developing the cities, uh, if you follow my thinking. Um, yes, uh, one thing about cities and biodiversity, another thing is that in Finland, many cities provide food for school children and, and in hospitals and, and wherever. And we know that 90%, more than 90% of, of biodiversity impacts of Finnish food consumption happens abroad, but still we are not in control in the food chains in a way that we would know that there's no deforestation in the, in the food chains. So that should be something that we need to take care of. And the, the uh, other side of the coin is that we need more meadows and, and places in the cities that are nice. So if we would have some grazing, grazing animals uh, somewhere w nicely located nearby cities or within the cities that would keep up the good, good uh, uh, um, cultural habitats for many species. So that would be uh, um, and maybe provide less less meat, but some special meat to the city um, food service units. Maybe that's something to think of. Thank you, Yusuf. 
Thank you. And then very quick from Helga. Wise words, Jussi. <laughs> mm, I was thinking uh, mm, that the, maybe we need new professionals. When Ville was talking about the new kind of building, how to fit together nature protection and and building, and and maybe also certificates, as we have in forestry, we have the certificates FSC, PEFC, and, uh, and after that, our forestry has has become better. The biological diversity in in uh, econ economical forests, it's better now. Uh, I think we need same same two uh, constructions, um, economical uh, mm, companies that that can give you the mm, uh, professional uh, advice how to build. I I know they talk about mm, organic architecture or ecological architecture already but there um, we need also the engineers to make it happen that you, was Helga. the most the biggest challenge in in the school project i told about okay mm -hmm. thank you helga i think there's also the possibility maybe for heinola to be a forerunner in finland doing this like you have been doing excellent work with uh, with nature questions there I think we will skip the meets because we got so many good questions from the audience and that was really, really great. Yes. But I would like to give a, a possibility for Ton to, to give us some greetings or some your thoughts about this discussion and maybe some future uh, projects that you are planning with nature uh, in Aymagen, please. Yeah. When I draw a conclusion uh, on biodiversity, you have several levels. You have the big level of uh, global level. And for a city as Nijmegen, as a compact city, it's far away from us because we don't have big uh, nature areas. So we focus very on city nature and working together with citizens on uh, green projects uh, changing our maintenance of our green into ecological maintenance. And we see uh, since European Green Capital Year uh, a change, um, political change, but also a change in, in organizations who will help us and a change in, in, the, in the citizens' mind to help us because yeah, more and more people uh, realize that it's not 5 to 12, but a long way uh, past 12 uh, on biodiversity. And they want to help, but they always, yeah, the difficulty is, of course, how, how, how. And we like money for that also. So that is the way we try to do it with small steps, but every step we make is a, is on the other hand, the big one. And uh, I think our city will, will change uh, every year more and more. And biodiversity, uh, also in, in a city like Nijmegen, will grow and grow and grow. And um, I hope a lot of cities are doing this uh, and, and that also on the scale of a, a city, yeah, things will change and that helps change the country. It's inspiring to, to go and see uh, the story of other cities, like it was really a pleasure to visit IMAG and once. Thanks, thanks a lot. Thank you. And this was our third episode of European Dialogue for Sustainable Cities. Yes, how would you summarize it, Sara? At least we got a lot of people discussing there yes. in the YouTube, which was really, really excellent. And it, I think it's, um, it's a sign that people are much interested about the topic itself and I think we need to discuss about biodiversity in urban context much more than we have been doing previously so that's a great sign. So yes in our next episode in one month uh, on the 5th of May we will discuss noise the unpleasant and unwanted sounds but also silence so we're also going to talk about silence.
So see you in a month. It's great that we talk about silence because I think we are rather famous about it in, in Finland. So things to share also. And I think that's um, a nice possibility for some of the visitors to also join the silent nature of ours probably during the, this year. Thank you very, very much, our great panelists, uh, for joining us today to this discussion. It was great to have you. Also, thanks a lot to the audience commenting a lot and, and great that you could also join. See you next time. This is the European Dialogue for Sustainable Cities. Bye. Bye bye.